Hello, friends, and welcome to Conversations with Consequences. We are the radio show and podcast of the Catholic Association, where we aim to change the culture one conversation at a time. You can listen to Conversations with Consequences on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. We are also on Sirius XM Channel 130. Of course, our radio show is always a podcast. Go to thecatholicassociation.org slash podcasts or directly to wherever you listen to your podcasts. Welcome back to Conversations with Consequences. I'm your hostess, Dr. Gracie Christie. And in this segment, my co-hostess and colleague at the Catholic Association, Lee Sneed, joins me. Welcome to the show, Lee. Thanks, Gracie. Always good to be with you. We have a great guest today for this segment, and her name is Tanya Geist. She has a new book called Eucharist, The Real Presence of Christ. Welcome to the show, Tanya. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Tanya, we've been talking a lot on the show in the last two or three weeks, even longer, about the Eucharist, because we've been taking our cue from the National Eucharistic Congress and and this this, this wonderful focus of the Church this year on the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist and and the kind of um, central presence as Catholics that He ought to have in our lives in the substance of the Eucharist, which um, I think is sort of an inexhaustible topic, so... It's really good to have you on. Absolutely. It's good to have you on. It's the mystery of divine presence in our world, right? So you could talk for quite a while. (laughs) And a thousand books or more have been written on the Eucharist (laughs) and and the tremendous power of the Eucharist. And it's the grace that it brings and and the way that it it connects us with God in this intimate way. So why don't you tell us about your book and what what your book brings to, to our understanding and our love of the Eucharist? Yeah, I would love to. Thank you. So uh, my book is a set of 12 reflections. Uh, Renew International asked me to write it as a small group resource, and it can be used for personal reflection as well. But the format of the book is as a small group study guide. So they're picturing groups at parishes getting together each week and thinking through what I've written out in this book. And so there are some scripture reflections and Um, prayers for the group to do together. But what I'm bringing in this book is just my own very personal reflections really on the mystery of the Eucharist. And I've had a really privileged background in trying to understand the mystery of the Eucharist because I was blessed to study at Blackfriars for a year, for example, when I was still an undergrad, I got to spend a year with the friars there in Oxford and in the tutorial system and trying to grapple with these theological mysteries. And that's what made me fall in love with theology in the first place. And I also got to see these Dominican friars like truly living out their prayer and study so seamlessly. And so that was kind of the beginning for me. And then after undergrad, I was also lucky enough to work inside the Vatican for two years when Benedict was still in the papacy. And um, for me, that was just this amazing formative experience because I was there in the office six days a week having to help translate and edit every single thing that Benedict said. Um, Because the the newspaper there where I was working is really more of a bulletin than a newspaper, I would say, (laughs) because they're they're printing every single thing the Pope says day in and day out. And so I really got to sit at Benedict's feet during those two years um, and absorb everything that he was preaching. And he does that in such a simple way but for Tanya, such a great mind that he is. Tanya, we, yes. are, we are now very jealous. We're all turning green listening to you. <laughs> no. Well, <laughs> I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that. Um, I'm jealous of my past self, if I'm honest too, Gracie. So, <laughs> uh, my life looks very different now. But um, for those two years, I really got to delve into that theology. And so um, I brought that into my master's studies at Notre Dame in systematic theology. And so I have all of these wonderful kind of mentors and guides in thinking about the Eucharist and about the Mass. Um, But now for the last 11 years, I've also been a mother and a wife, and I've been in those trenches taking care of kids. And like I just said, life looks very different now. But I do think that as women and as mothers, we have a privileged view into sort of the visceral, physical nature of what life is about and what our faith is about. And so I tried to combine those things when I wrote the book and really just kind of bring my own perspective to it, which was difficult for me because I like just quoting the masters and not necessarily bringing my own 
um, my own view into my writing, but my editors really pushed me to, to bring myself into it. And so now it feels like a very personal sort of like fruit of my labor that I'm putting out there in this book. And I really hope that it helps people to reflect on the Eucharist. Yeah, I really think those personal stories that you include are really, really compelling. And I think they're they're a way to bring uh, someone who's not familiar, who hasn't had the privilege of, you know, your educational opportunities and grappling with these big questions um, in, you know, uh, academic setting. Um, I think that the you know, through the family, through that sort of fleshiness that we, especially as mothers, um, grapple with every day uh, to bring us to, you know, to bring us to Christ through that sort of very corporeal experience um, as a way to, you know, interact with the divine. I love the talk about the um, Easter celebration in particular with your kids. Um, And, the joy that they have or like the just the the joy of the participation and in, in in celebrating like the victory over death mm-hmm. really really loved that and actually reminded me um once of um i have two of my sons are on the autism spectrum and they make it very clear that they are very bored by mass but they do get kind of excited for communion and i'm always glad about that and one week, I wasn't even paying attention. All of a sudden, I see one of my sons just go and give the Eucharistic minister a big high five after. (laughs) And I was like, oh, no. (laughs) He was almost moved to tears because she was just like, it's so joyful. The triumph, like she was just so moved by it. And it's like, wow, you know, okay, step back, enjoy what our kids can actually, you know, bring to the table with this. And so did you find that you find I love that complementarity between sort of that, like everydayness and like your academic training, um, you know, between like that sort of visceral experience uh, with your kids and the academic, like how did that, especially when writing a book, I can understand like what you said, like you would rather just quote someone. How did you sort of meld those two experiences together? Yeah, I mean, it was really tricky. And like I said, my editors had to really push me to include my own stories in there. But I do think that they dovetail really nicely. And and really that like, without the illustrations of those personal stories and moments, the theology can feel really dry and impersonal. And so even if they're stating things as exuberantly and <laughs> enthusiastically as possible when, when you're there preaching, um, without that lived experience of family life or maybe other forms of caretaking, um, we really can't experience the joy of like the true intimate charity that Jesus has in mind for us in the Eucharist, because we're not only connecting with him, we're connecting with the whole community. And and what a greater understanding we have of both of those um, when we are ensconced in a family setting, you know? Yeah, that's really beautiful. And actually, I was thinking when you were talking about whimsy, about how that reminds us of the joy and the risen Christ and what, you know, what we're all here for it was almost platonic the way you talked about it. And Mm. they're giving these great examples of New Orleans jazz or, you know, your kids giggling or, you know, this sort of just shared common experiences, but it's as a reflection of things that wouldn't be possible without this deep essential joy that we experience as Catholic Christians. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, we lived in New Orleans for a year and it's such a liturgically deep place to be like the sacramental imagination is so alive and well there and yeah just getting to hear live music regularly with our kids and dance and and sort of feel the depth of these roots and emotions through the music like it was such a human experience to be there and it really informs the way that I think about things because yeah it's just a a really amazing example of trying to find joy and whimsy in those day-to-day moments because we can talk till we're blue in the face about how Christ should bring us joy. And it can become really superficial too, to talk about how we're supposed to be joyful as Christians. But unless you can really anchor yourself in some solid moments of like communal joy and happiness and celebration, even amidst really hard times, like if you don't have those tensions and those interplays going on in your life, like you might miss it. Tanya, I have two questions for you. A lot has been said, and we've mentioned it on the show before, this terrible uh, statistic that 
most Catholics don't believe in the real presence or don't understand it enough to even say yes or no about it. What do you think the consequences of, of that are? And well, and then we'll go on to the next one. What do you think the giant consequences of that kind of missed opportunity are for American Catholicism? Sure. So, I mean, I think it's a, it's just a missed opportunity for relationship uh, because that's what the Eucharist is all about is it's Jesus coming to us in the flesh uh, to be with us, to even enter within us. And so Christ thirsts for that relationship with us. And if we don't have a grasp on what we're doing in the mass, then we don't understand the relationship that we're invited into. And so it's just a really sad missed opportunity for, for relationship with Jesus, but also for, for growth too, because relationship with Jesus is also supposed to mean that we're growing as people, which is something I talk about in the book as well, like this beautiful interplay of individual growth and and communal unity that can happen or that should happen in the Eucharist. So, um, so yeah, if there's a lack of understanding, it's just there's, we're missing the boat of, of joy and charity and, and just what God intended us for, really. Okay, and the other question, and thank you for that. That's I think you're exactly right. That's you're exactly on. That's what I that's what I sense too. A huge missed yeah. opportunity and a lack of, and really a lack of faith, hope, and love, right? Um, exactly. Yeah. The end, because the it's the Eucharist that connects us to to those deepest to those deepest emanations from the Spirit, right? That 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 really sustain us. I think that's my experience yes. anyway as a Catholic. Yeah. And here's another Absolutely. question. What do you where do you think that we went wrong? Like because your book is a beautiful book dedicated to creating to for your for small groups or for personal reflection to really deepen our understanding of 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 the Eucharist and and all the the amazing ways that it helps us to connect to Jesus. But in the past, people didn't maybe didn't have access to this this kind of knowledge, but they still had a reverence for the Eucharist. What do you think went wrong? Like, how did we get off track? How did we lose our understanding? Even if before maybe people had maybe less information, was it a lack of catechesis or a lack of of liturgical appropriateness or a, Sometimes I see people going up to receive, like everyone receives all the time, and you know that they can't all possibly be in a state of grace. Uh, they receive right. in their hands sort of casually. There's like a, like a casualness about things. What do you think? Mm, well, that's definitely a huge topic to tackle, and I'm not a liturgical buff or catechetical <laughs> history buff, but I do see quite a crisis in catechesis that happened over the last century where I was on one of the webinar talks that I gave for this book. There was a woman who asked a question at the end who said that she had been told by her priest to to not use the word transubstantiation in, in her catechesis classes oh um, and was like scolded and condescended to for doing this. Um, and it was a really sad story from her, but also not super surprising, unfortunately, because I've heard a lot of bad stories about a real lack of catechesis in the past 50 or so years. So, um, I do think it's a catechetical issue, but, um, from where I'm sitting, I think in a lot of ways, it's a crisis of isolation and like lack of community and just mm. the way that our human ecology has broken down and we're so isolated. We're so, you know, it's just the household and that's it. And um, I think that because what it takes to be a true Christian is so, so embedded in what it takes to just be a good person that's like kind and loving, you know, um, we don't, we're lacking in a lot of those human kind of social skills now, um, given the extent of our isolation. And I think also that like the joy and the whimsy that we already talking about that can happen when humans are able to like be together and play together and learn from each other. And like, yeah. for example, see the world through a children, through a child's eyes, like there's so much wonder there. And we've lost the wonder. Like to me, a big part of this is a crisis of wonder. And I think that's a big antidote as well to be able to see the world and see the mass through the eyes of a child um, that has that wonder still about what a miracle everything is. Yeah, and you think too about, I mean, about your uh, emphasis on the crucifix, about the vertical and the horizontal. And really, if, I mean, it's right in front of us when we when we go to mass. And, you know, despite any sort of catechetical missteps or, you know, misinformation, I mean, it's all right there. If you reflect on that, if you reflect on our relationship with Christ, and then the fact that we gather together to do this together every, I mean, would be great if we did it every day, but every Sunday, 
um, yes. you know, together as a community. This is something we do together. We say these words together as Catholics. We profess our faith. We do this really radical thing, you know, by receiving the body and blood of Christ. It's a, you know, it's a shared experience. Um, it's not something, you know, that you don't get it through like some, like a secret little hidey hole in your front door, you know, or like a some priest slips it in in the middle of the night, you know, you don't, <laughs> don't do it in private. This is like a group activity on purpose. Yeah. Yes. Um, and as like, Catholics, we have to hold on to that. We have to remember that yeah, it's, it's a, as the body of Christ, like that means three things, right? Body of Christ has three meanings in scripture. There's the person of Jesus, there's the bread that is broken, and there's the community of believers. And we have to remember all three of those. And I love the cross image as such a simple reminder of that. Like even just making the sign of the cross or seeing a cross in our church. Um, I really wish that that could help people call to mind the fact that like we have to look up at heaven and at God. We have to foster that relationship. But we also really have to look side to side and see the people suffering next to us or struggling in whatever ways and reach out to them because that's what becoming like Jesus is about. So if we don't have both sides of that, we really lose a lot. You you, you said the word becoming. And one thing that, that I say to people when I'm encouraging them to come to, to daily mass and receive the Eucharist more often than just once on Sundays, once a week on Sundays, is about how the Eucharist transforms the, the, the one who communicates, right? The one, the one who takes the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. In session 12, yeah. your session is called Receive Who You Are. And you have this beautiful quote uh, from, from the Velveteen Rabbit. It says, it doesn't happen all at once, said the skin horse to the Velveteen Rabbit. You become, it takes a long time. That's why it doesn't happen often to people who break easily. Tell us, tell us about mm -hmm. that session. What, what do you communicate in that session? Yes. Okay. So that is definitely my favorite session. I just love it so much. It was just a culminating chapter for me to sort of discover some of those connecting points as I was writing it. But the Velveteen Rabbit is this beautiful illustration of this point about becoming more real. It's just such a great story. David Foster Wallace in an interview once called it the most purely moving thing he had ever read. Mm. Um, and he's not a Christian, right? Like it, it really speaks to this core desire that we have as humans that our relationships will truly form and define us. And also that desire for salvation, right? That we're redeemable as individuals. Um, and so what I'm trying to do in this chapter is talk about how the Eucharist can help us to become more ourselves. Um, and, and Augustine, like you said, has this amazing quote. He used to say to the newly baptized, he would, um, as he was preaching, he would tell them, he's like, in the Eucharist, when I give you the host, you receive what you are. And that's so mind blowing. Like I've talked about it for months now and it still just absolutely blows my mind to think of that phrase that, that you we gave me, you gave me goosebumps. You say it and it gives me goosebumps. <laughs> Isn't it amazing though? Like it still gives me goosebumps. Like how can that be so? Because the Eucharist is Jesus. Like I am not God, but all the same, like he wants to fold us into that love. He wants to bring us into his body of Christ and he wants us to become the people that he made us to be. Um, and, and that's why you can have this strange dynamic where it's like, okay, if I'm entering into the body of Christ, doesn't that mean that I just sort of get subsumed into this whole? It's like the church is huge. Like I'm just kind of coming into this big body of Christ and I'm going to lose myself, right? But no, like it's the opposite of that because somehow since it's Jesus that we're talking about, um, and since we're made in the image of God, we sort of have this kernel within us to become more like Jesus and in doing so become more ourselves, which is just a miracle really, <laughs> but it's what God carved out for us. And, and it really, yeah, it never tires of giving me goosebumps. So in that chapter, I'm just trying to say like, the Eucharist can help us become like more who we're meant to be. Um, you can think of the Catherine of Siena quote that everyone loves, but also like, there's really interesting literary examples of it, like the Velveteen Rabbit, right? Because the Velveteen Rabbit, like you're so sad when he can't be who he is for, you know, the little stuffy that has to be burned. It's so sad. But then at the end, he becomes a real rabbit. And you're like, oh, like there really is this analogy of like, here we are on earth as humans. 
and we suffer and things are hard. And it seems like, you know, the losses that we're going through are everything, but actually we're meant to be one with God in heaven after all of this. And that we can kind of go on a similar journey of finding ourselves. And it's all about love really. Um, and, and I was saying over email before this, I was saying that I really loved your episode, Gracie, with Haley Stewart, where you talked about George McDonald, because um, the light princess was also on my mind when I did yeah, that exactly. chapter. And I didn't get to fold it in, but I love that story so much. And I think the fact that, um, that just those images are so powerful of the lake that's drying up. And I was in a book club in South Bend where one of the moms reflected that the lake is like our sacraments, like without our sacraments, we would sort of wither away, you know? Mm. Uh, I loved that image that she connected. But I also, um, I also love the fact that in Great Divorce, which I did get to use in the book, that George MacDonald is sort of the Virgil to C.S. Lewis's yeah, character. I love, that too. I love that so much. And, um, and I think it really points to this same overall topic that we like, we need that baptism of imagination that Lewis described McDonald as, as being able to give to him. That we really need to baptize our imaginations in these beautiful images that are so awash with meaning because like they mean those things for us individually and we have so much to offer. Um, so that's what that chapter concludes with is that like Augustine is calling us to offer our whole lives as an amen. And that's such a unique thing that we can offer. It's such a gift that we're able to offer it. Tanya, that no, makes it, me, it's, oh, oh, sorry. sorry. Tanya, that <laughs> makes me, that makes me think of how we are, it, as modern people, we're very cynical about things like the mystic things and the supernatural things and the magical things. And there is that, there's that magic about the Eucharist. It's transformative power. It, it's, it's above it's way beyond any scientific thing that we could think about. It's, it's an, it, it exists on another realm. And we're very cynical. And it's that lack, as you say, the lack of, of imagination um, that we have as moderns. Maybe that's what's missing in people. Um, when I they think it's a huge Eucharist. piece of it. Yeah. And Chesterton even called McDonald once. He called him a mystic half mad with joy. Yeah, I that's a that. McDonald. That is that is I George love McDonald. That. I just love that so much. Yeah. You know, and I that's think what... Tanya, the way you point out this stuff, I mean this this daily remind this gift in the Eucharist that we have of you know our telos, like that we can yes, become yeah. who we are meant to be. It's such an anecdote to this, like Gracie was saying, like this modernity, this nihilism. That's just sort of willy nilly, you know, not rooted in anything, but that we are already, we already are in potentia, I guess, who we are meant to be. Yeah, and we're we on have the path. This we're pilgrims. But we have, yes, and we have this experience that we can actively partake in to consume even mm -hmm. that becomes then part of us. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's really unbelievable. And I, your book is just such a gift in, the, in this, these reminders um, with these very relatable examples. It brings these big ideas down and really these nice digestible nuggets without watering it down. It's, it's really a, an amazing gift you've given other Catholics. In session five. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's the goal. In session five, Tanya, you, you talk about um, the Viaticum, Viaticum, um, so that's our last Eucharist, right? <laughs> We're very, very fortunate. We get to mm -hmm. we get to have that before we go to our eternal reward. And tell us about that. That that to me is also very. I've had very, I've had many very moving experiences around that. But tell us about that. Yeah. So that chapter was inspired by the experience I had when my dad passed away. Um, I had at that point given birth to our first child, was pregnant with our second. And I couldn't believe the similarities between the experience of birth and the experience of death. Like I had no idea that there were similar sort of stages that you watch for when someone is on their way to Jesus. Um, and the, the hospice workers to me were like angels in the room because they were like, they were like midwives to my dad. And, and I just had no idea of those parallels until I was in it. Um, and so that was just like an extremely faith 
gratifying, like space solidifying Mm -hmm. um, stage for me and my life because I had no idea that death was like birth in that way. And so watching my dad go as difficult as that was, it really affirmed my faith that like he was going on to another place. He wasn't just leaving. He wasn't just dying. He was going on to be with God. And, and it, it really did seem like a birth into the next life. And, and those physical, those physical elements of of the way that it happened. I just, I had no clue that there were, that there were those ways to see sort of the midwifery in it. And, and so it was, yeah, it really changed my faith in a, in a positive sort of grounding way as difficult it was as it was to go through that. Yeah. And I love the word that you use for that threshold um, because that's what we experience at the beginning and the end. We're alive before we're born, but there's a real threshold obviously that we pass through. And then again, at the end, um, yeah. you know, for our eternal salvation, Tanya, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. This was a delight. Yeah. We can't wait to have you back on and talk more about the fruits of your book and maybe, Um, Maybe we can even talk to some of the people who participated in some of your discussion groups. That would be amazing. Yeah. Tanya, where can people find your book, which is called, let me remind them, uh, Eucharist, The Real Presence of Christ. It is on the Renew International website. That's the only place you can buy it. Uh, So you would look up Renew International and my name. And for your listeners, they've got a special discount code that if they punch in podcast 10, then they can receive 10% off on the book. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, Tanya Geist. And again, the book is Eucharist, The Real Presence of Christ. It's been a pleasure, Tanya. This was lovely. Thank you so much. Welcome back to Conversations with Consequences. I'm your hostess, Dr. Gracie Christie, and I'm very excited to welcome our next guest. Her name is Sabrina Ferrisi, and she is an author and a freelance journalist, and she is the author of a book called Blessed Carlo Acutis, The Amazing Discovery of a Teenager in Heaven. Welcome to the show, Sabrina. Wonderful to be here. Let's start with a thumbnail sketch of the Blessed Carlo Acuti's life. For our listeners that may not know about this really, really inspiring young man. Absolutely. He was born in in London to two Italian parents in uh, 1991. And uh, they moved to Milan after a few months and he spent the rest of his life in Milan. He passed away in 2006 at the age of 15. But what he did in those 15 years was just amazing. And it has been really an inspiration for young people around the world, but also for adults, for for everyone who gets to know his story. He's really been an inspiration. On one hand, he lived a really normal life. He had friends, he skied, he, you know, did karate, he had dogs and cats, and uh, he was just lived a normal life as a millennial. But he also had this extraordinary side where he was really really full of faith. He loved the Lord, had no problems talking about him to his friends at school. A lot of people converted during his life simply because of you know, his conversations with them. He went to mass every day from the age of seven onwards. He really lived a very full, dynamic Catholic life, and he loved the Eucharist. He loved the Eucharist. And the other thing about him is, and, and we all know about this, is he loved computers. So he, he was a computer programmer. He taught himself had a program and he created all these websites that had to do with our faith. Um, So he used his gifts to evangelize as it was. And he really shows us how we can live as holy people in modern times with all this technology around us. He shows us that it can be done, basically. Mm -hmm. You know, Sabrina, I feel that what happens very much to us these days in, in modern times is that we think that holiness must have been easier before. Right before, yeah. and we say, "Oh, the world is very complicated, and the world is is uh, coming at us from all directions, and we never get to rest because of the computers." And right. life was better before, in a sense, right? Like the rhythms of agriculture, or you know, small communities where you didn't really leave your community, or you didn't have exposure to other things. But yeah. I think what Carlo Acutis does is he puts he puts all that in the perspective that it deserves. T- yeah. Tell me what you think about that. Yeah, no, he shows us that holiness can be lived today. Mm-hmm. And 
it's funny because when I wrote my book about him, I was thinking the whole time I was writing, okay, I'm writing for middle school kids or young high school kids. But by the end of my project, I'm like, who am I kidding? I'm writing for me. I'm writing yeah. for me. So I learned a lot as an adult. And like one of the things he said is that we can't let all these electronics dominate us. We have to dominate them. So we can use it for ourselves. Like, you know, I... Uh, I use apps to pray, to say the rosary, like I use it for my spiritual life, but um, I try to learn and I, I, you know, I try to catch myself, like, how do I use this for my spiritual life, not to cut into my spiritual life or ruin my spiritual life. And so that's what I think he really teaches us is that we actually can use all this technology for good. And, and, you know, he was aware that all this technology can do terrible things. He told his mom, you know, this can be an atomic bomb for good or for bad. So we have to make sure that we use the technology we have for good for ourselves and the world around us and for our spiritual lives. You know, what interests me is that in, in, in general, in history, man has always been challenged by new technology, whether yeah. that was the first fire <laughs> that man was able to build yeah. or, or the first time he was able to plant and, and harvest. And then later on, things like the Industrial Revolution, the introduction of the spinning, the spinning jenny. And now women weren't making textiles at home or um, going or, or, or the train, right? Uh, and the yeah. car and all that, like transportation, the telegram. We're always challenged by technology. And, and then we find ourselves today uh, saying, oh, no, no, but this technology is different. This is really a game changer. And this one is going to drive me away from God and not towards God. But isn't that how people must have always felt? And is, some, is that something that that your book on Carlo Acutis can, can help us navigate? Yeah, yeah, no, he definitely, so he was a very prayerful person, which is also something that is um, a beautiful thing to see and an inspiration. Like he spent time every day, so he went to Mass, but he also spent time in Eucharistic adoration. He would say either 15 minutes before Mass or 15 minutes after, and he was very thoughtful. So he was, like, uh, after he died, you know, his mother found his journals, and he wrote his thoughts, and, you know, he was thoughtful about how do I use my technology? Mm -hmm. How do the things that I have, what and what is God's plan for me? So we have to think about not only what God has for us to do, but how are we thoughtfully going to do it? And what are the tools we can use? So, you know, for us, for better, or for worse, we live in a world full of technology, but we can really use it to do wonderful things. Mm -hmm. I so guess if you, if, if he teaches yeah. us that if you put God at the center of your life, yeah. then maybe there's no technology that can, that can sweep you off that path, right? If God is your central focus and everything revolves around him, including your technology. Exactly. Like there are, there are, there are right ways to use it and very powerful ways, but you have to spend that time in prayer, thinking about it and praying about it and asking for light. He would ask God for light mm -hmm. and, and he would write about it, you know, uh, in his journal. Like, so he didn't come to it one day to the next, but he slowly came to the awareness that this was his gift. Computer programming was his gift. And how could he use it, you know, for good? And, uh, but he also not, I mean, besides the websites, he created, you know, the website on Eucharistic Miracles, which is amazing. He created his um, parish's first website. This was a time when, you know, not all the parishes even had a website. So he created a website for his parish, for his high school. He created a website on, um, on uh, community service, encouraging kids to volunteer in their community. But he also used his computers like like he helped students in his school make PowerPoint presentations because, you know, he was probably the best in his class. And so he used it to help others learn how to use their computers. You know, when his neighbor's uh, computer would break down, he would help them uh, fix it. So, mm -hmm. um, so he really he was very thoughtful. He was very thoughtful and he put God at the center. So I totally agree that that's really what we should learn from him about that. One thing that, that um, inspires me very much about him and other young uh, blesseds or young saints, as he will be soon, um, yeah. is that we, I, I think nowadays we tend, we tend to, on the one hand, idolize young people as, as the center of the world, and on the other hand, not to expect too much from them. Um, and we don't expect them to be holy. We don't expect them to go to mass every day. We don't like we we don't hold them up to high expectations spiritually or morally, although we on the other hand do idolize them for their physical beauty and their strength and all that and we 
they're sort of the most important thing on earth. And at the same time, they're not, we don't expect much from them. How does, how does Carlo Acuti's change that, um, that paradigm? Well, I think that, so he shows that, you know, you can achieve great, great holiness at a very young age. It's absolutely possible. But, you know, he was open to the grace and he, he asked for the grace. Like he, even as a, um, I interviewed his mom four times and she said that even as a young, young, young child, he had, it was apparent that he had been given a special grace mm -hmm. of a, the presence of God. Like if he walked down the street, he, he needed to go in every single church and say hi to Jesus. He just couldn't walk by. And so he did receive the grace, but he asked for it. And, you know, when he was a catechist, when he was 11 years old, he started um, assistant teaching in his CCD program in his parish. And so he came up with a little kit for kids of, you know, how to become a saint. So he would say, you know, try to go to mass every day. Try to say the rosary every day. Try to spend a, a few minutes a day reading the Bible. But one of the first things he said is pray for the desire to be a saint, because not all of us even have that desire And so the first thing on his kit to be a saint was pray for the desire to become a saint. Pray for that desire for holiness. What a, what a beautiful wisdom from such a young mind. Yes. No, he was, he was really, really wise. Um, very, very aware of the presence of God in his everyday life. And, but also, you know what it is? He was very fun. Like he wasn't, uh, this is one thing that struck me. He wasn't like the kid at the corner of the room who no one was friends with. The pious. He, was he wasn't that pious kid that everybody says, oh, he's going to become a priest. But, <laughs> but no one liked him. Right. Yeah. Everyone loved him. He <laughs> everyone in the school. And that's the interesting thing. Like the friends that he had, he wasn't just friends with like the religious kids. He was friends with kids who never went to mass. He invited them over his house. And um, he was capable of being friends with people wherever they were on their spiritual journey. And he would talk about his faith, but he was never pushy, but he would, but he, he wasn't hiding it either, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and that's one thing his mother was saying. Um, I heard her give a speech in New York last year. And she said, one of the mysteries is that he wasn't, you know, isolated and uh, bullied at all. Kids knew that he was the religious kid and yet they, respected him. When he raised his hand in school and talked, people would kind of listen to him because he was he was able to explain the faith in a very engaging and attractive way. That is so, so special among, well, you know, I was going to say it's so special among young people, but any, any experience with young people, you, there are these, there are these, these, these young souls, <laughs> which, yeah. who yeah. are really plugged into God and like the Blessed Carlo Acutis, maybe not to that extent, but they do radiate that simple faith. And, and, and you see other children wanting to be with them, right? And, and feeling very comfortable with them. So I imagine that was that kind of thing that he was able to do. Yeah, yeah, no. I think holiness, when it's authentic, is attractive. Mm -hmm. It's not weird and off-putting. It is attractive. It, it, it attracts people to them. And it makes people ask themselves, huh, Why is he, why, first of all, why is he so happy? <laughs> yes, there's always that joy. Guys, he was a happy kid. Like he had a very good life and a very full and rich life. So the faith gives to you. It doesn't take away from you. And I think that's sort of um, another message is that he had, a, he had a wonderful, deep, rich, full life. And that's what true faith gives you. How did It, he manage? Uh, he died of cancer, I believe. So, yeah, he died of leukemia and it was all of a sudden he, you know, it was his first month of his sophomore year in high school. I know you're a mother. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, he was suddenly not feeling well. So his parents thought it was the flu. They didn't think anything of it. But then after a few days, they um, there was one morning that he couldn't get out of bed mm -hmm. and they panic. And so they, they called their doctor. The doctor said, bring him to the ER. And that's when they did blood tests and realized he had this extreme form of leukemia. And it was terminal. And the other sad thing is that the leukemia he had today would have been, um, you can cure it. But at that time, they didn't know how to cure it. It was 2006. So, um, and from how, the long, moment, how long did he live after that, after lived, the diagnosis? Three days. After the diagnosis, he lived three more days and he passed away. Three days? Three days. So it was really sudden to the point where there were people who had seen him the week before and he was fine. So God took him really fast. You know, that was very lovely of God. I mean, yeah, exactly. On one hand, I'm like, we did, obviously I wouldn't want him to suffer more. 
And on the other hand, it's like he lived such a full life. Like he had done really everything, everything you know, God. If you apply a supernatural vision to his life, that's exactly how a beautiful life should go. That was a beautiful gift from God. I don't want to say that. And maybe his mother doesn't agree or someone. Uh, oh, oh, it's, it's, I mean, it's still heartbreaking. You know, when I was interviewing mom, I was cognizant that this is a mom who lost her son at 15. And, and I just can't imagine. Um, hopefully that would never happen to me. I have five kids too. You know, my, my grandmother lost um, one of her daughters young to leukemia. Oh and my, my aunt. And um, she's, she t she's already passed away, but she told me many times about that, that horror. And her daughter lived four months in a hospital oh, in boy. terrible pain. And the last couple of weeks on life support, which my my grandmother, my grandfather was stuck in Cuba, so he couldn't help. So he wasn't even yeah. there for her. I mean, she had to decide to uh, to take her off life support. And yeah. she spoke, you know, 40 years later, that's she brought that up every time we saw each other. So yeah. anyway, I know that to lose a child is possibly the, the worst possible thing, but that's also no, sort it, of a blessing that it was fast. Especially was. someone like Carlo Acutis, who was prepared to make yeah. that leap into the life, the full life with God. Absolutely. So that's the thing. Carla was always talking about the last things about heaven, hell, purgatory. And he was um, doing um, all the activities to receive plenary indulgences all the time. So he was very, very prepared. So at least his mother knew. Um, and she, you know, she asked him, like, well, he told her, I'm going to give you signs that I'm with God. And, she, and he has, he's a, he's appeared to her in dreams many oh, times. Oh, how beautiful. Yeah. And she lives with the, um, I guess the happiness to know that he has been inspiring so many people around the world. And there are so many miracles that are taking place because of Carlos. She told me last time we spoke that, so they have a website, the official Carlo Cookies website, where they say, if you, if you've received a miracle, a favor, a grace, please let us know. She says every day we receive news of medical miracles with documentation from around the world. So the, you you know, he was just, um, it was just announced that they approved the second miracle, but it's not like there were only two. There were hundreds, hundreds. And so she said, I mean, some of these miracles she said were incredible. What a beautiful so she, satisfaction. That's not given yeah, to many yeah, people. Exactly. So, I mean, it's devastating to lose your child, but he is very active. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he is in heaven. So, and other miracles too, like miracles of conversion, uh, which are incredible miracles, people coming back to their faith. She hears these stories every day. Sabrina so. Ferrisi, your, your book is called Blessed Carlo Acutis, The Amazing Discovery of a Teenager in Heaven. Who do you recommend this for? Is this a, a book for young adults? Oh, so, you know, I wrote this. Well, at the time I wrote it, my I think my youngest son was in the eighth grade. So I was thinking about him when I wrote it. But it, I mean, it could be for any young person. But honestly, I think it's for adults too, <laughs> because we all face the same issues of technology that young people face. So um, I think it's good for anyone. I think it's good for anyone, you know, for parents who want to buy it for their, their youngsters, but even for them, for themselves to read it. Because I literally, I got so much out of researching this story for me. Carlo has really humbled me. I, I realized how much more I could do in my life because he was already doing it at such a young age. Exactly. So, exactly. Yeah. That's what the young saints do for us, right? Yeah, and it's a great story, and I would recommend it for anyone. Where can we? Where can our listeners buy? Oh, book? yeah, Holy Heroes um, has a website, holyheroes dot com. But you can also go to Amazon because it's now on Amazon. Wonderful! Thank you so much, Sabrina Farisi, for joining oh. us, and thank oh. you for sharing your beautiful insight and wisdom into the life of blessed, soon to be saint Carlo Acutis. It was wonderful speaking with you. See. Every morning, the Catholic Association reviews all the latest news and sends our subscribers a carefully curated collection of the most important news of the day. Items are specifically selected for a smart Catholic audience like you. Don't let the world take you by surprise. Subscribe to our daily media roundup at thecatholicassociation.org. And now, Father Roger Landry offers us, as is customary, a short and inspiring homily to prepare us for this Sunday's Gospel. This is Father Roger Landry, and it's a privilege for me to be with you. As we enter into the consequential conversation, the risen Lord Jesus wants to have with each of us this Sunday, which Jesus will continue to speak to us for the fourth of five weeks on the mystery of his body and blood in the Holy Eucharist. How much we need to hear this as the Church in the United States tries to respond to the many graces to live the ongoing Eucharistic revival well. We need the revival, because for the most part... Most Catholics in the United States have not lived by what Jesus teaches us so clearly during these weeks. So let's enter into what we will hear, hopefully, with fresh ears. 
In the second reading of Sunday's Mass, St. Paul will tell the Ephesians and us, be careful then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise. He'll encourage us to make the most of the opportunity of life, not to continue in ignorance, but try to understand what is the will of God. He stresses that we have a choice about how we are to live. Well, there are many who live unwisely and in ignorance, who waste the opportunity of life God has given them. St. Paul reminds us of God's call to live differently, to seize the chance and live according to his will. But what does it mean to live wisely, to make the most of our opportunity, to live according to the will of God? The first reading from Sunday's Mass tells us, The book of Proverbs shows wisdom building her house, preparing a banquet, and inviting others to come in. Wisdom is a term, a title for God. God says, you who are simple, turn and hear. To the one who lacks understanding, wisdom says, Come, eat of my food and drink of the wine I have mixed. Forsake foolishness that you may live. Advance in the way of understanding. Notice what wisdom, what God doesn't do to pass on his wisdom. He doesn't build a classroom and prepare a lecture. Significantly, he builds a house, we could even say a church, and prepares a banquet. He doesn't bring in the ignorant principally to teach them, but to feed them on the bread and wine he's gotten ready, which wisdom calls my food. They will grow in the path of wisdom, in other words, through consuming wisdom, through becoming what they eat. The foolish think we can learn it all intellectually, that faith is fundamentally an intellectual exercise, in which we can comprehend everything we need to. It's not that instruction is unimportant. Learning from Jesus the Master is essential. But it's also true that our finite minds can only learn and retain so much. The wise path, the one in which we advance in the way of understanding, is one in which we enter into communion with that nourishment that we cannot make or achieve on our own. The nourishment God provides at the banquet he's throwing in the house he's built. This sets the tone, obviously, for Sunday's consequential conversation in the Gospel. When wisdom incarnate, Jesus Christ will speak about the fulfillment of the prophecy of the banquet of wisdom announced in Proverbs. Jesus tells us that to live wisely, to advance in the way of understanding, we need literally to eat his flesh and drink his blood. We know that the scribes and the Pharisees and many of the disciples were much more comfortable with an intellectual or conceptual religion, memorizing and repeating the scriptures or rabbinical commentaries. When Jesus, however, in this Sunday's Gospel, tells them something that surpasses their human ability to understand, when he tells them that the path to true wisdom was to become simple and to eat of the food and imbibe the drink he had prepared, they responded with doubts and derision. We see in them foolishness masquerading as intelligence, worldly prudence substituting for true wisdom. They murmured, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Such a reaction on the surface was reasonable. If some ordinary rabbi had said that others needed to consume his flesh, we could understand why there would be opposition. If a mother were to tell us that for dinner we're going to consume dad's flesh and drink grandma's blood, we'd be disturbed and wonder if she had taken hallucinogens. But the crowds present were saying this about the same man who the previous day had fed 25,000 people on five loaves and two fish, who had been astonishing and amazing them with this teaching over the past two years, whom they had witnessed heal people by the hundreds, making paralyzed men walk, people with withered hands whole, curing lepers and liberating those possessed by demons. None of that now seemed to matter. Their worldly wisdom, which tried to frame everything according to worldly categories, rather than reframing their human categories according to God's, led them to reject the enfleshment of God's wisdom when at last that wisdom came. Next week we'll hear that it wasn't just the pagans who rejected Jesus, it wasn't just the hard-hearted scribes and Pharisees and the feeble-hearted worldly Sadducees. Many of Jesus' disciples would say, this is a hard teaching who can endure it. And they would walk away from Jesus as if Jesus would never challenge them beyond their theological and gastronomic comfort zones. Even many disciples were not simple, humble, and faithful enough to eat wisdom and become truly wise. Now it comes to us. Throughout this triennial five-week course in the Holy Eucharist, Jesus has been getting us ready to make a choice. He repeatedly challenges us this Sunday, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats me will live because of me. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. He was truth and wisdom incarnate, is telling us that unless we eat him, we will have no life. We will be just walking spiritual corpses. We may still have bios, the Greek word that indicates the biological life we share with plants and animals. We won't really have zoe, the type of divine life that he came into the world to give us so that we might have life more abundantly. 
Jesus gives us the greatest wisdom of all, that to live is to live off of him. But there are many who reject this wisdom, including Catholics, who tragically forsake Jesus each Sunday as he eagerly desires to feed us with himself at Mass, or who neglect him on holy days, like last Thursday's Solemnity of Our Lady's Assumption. Moreover, many who would never miss Mass on Sunday or holy days still do not live by Jesus' teaching, because they do not find in him and the Holy Eucharist their life principle. To eat Jesus' body and drink his blood is more than a mechanical act of digesting him, the same way we consume a donut or drink coffee. To eat his body and drink his blood means to draw our life from him, to treat him as God, and recognize that without him in our life we're devoid of the one thing necessary. Coming to Mass, some say to themselves, is a good thing, a holy thing, an important religious duty they faithfully accomplish. But they don't really look at Mass, at adoration, at a truly Eucharistic life, as a thing of life and death. And that's what Jesus is telling us during this five-week course. It's a thing of life and death. A few Catholics look at the Eucharist this way. For example, if they weren't able to receive Jesus on a given week because of weather or sickness or travel, they, would, they wouldn't feel forlorn of the most essential reality in life. Many can miss Mass with a certain nonchalance. They don't feel spiritually dead when they don't receive the greatest gift in the history of the world. Perhaps because they've never really yet G allowed Jesus in the Eucharist to bring them fully alive. Jesus means what he says, and we shouldn't succumb to the temptation of the evil one to try to water his words down. Unless we eat his flesh and drink his blood, unless we enter into communion with him and keep that holy communion with him, we have no zoe, no life in us. To the extent that we're spiritually alive, it's because we're living because of him. The Second Vatican Council phrased this teaching in a very powerful way. They said that Jesus in the Eucharist is the source and summit of the Christian life. He's the source, the point from which everything flows. And he is the summit, the goal toward which everything goes. If we're living a life that's truly Christian, we'll be uniting everything we do to Jesus in the Holy Eucharist. If we're not actively and consciously uniting all that we're doing to our Eucharistic Lord, we're not yet truly living the Christian life. Christian life, in other words, doesn't involve merely knowing, for example, the catechism or living by the Ten Commandments or attending Mass each week or going to confession at least once a year. It involves making Jesus in the Eucharist the source and the summit, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end of our life, drawing our strength from Jesus in the Eucharist and seeking to do everything in communion with him. The choice facing us each this Sunday involves true growth in wisdom or remaining where we are. Jesus will say to us with the words of Proverbs, You who are simple, turn and hear. Divine wisdom will call to us again, saying, Come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. Lay aside immaturity and walk in the way of insight. The choice before us is to draw our life from holy communion with Jesus and to live off of him in the Mass, or to seek our life principle somewhere else, serving some other God of our own making, or structuring our life on some other foundation than him who is the rock. This is the most important choice we're ever going to make in life. If during this revival we truly choose Jesus, it will change not only the way we look at Sunday Mass, but also daily Mass, at Eucharistic adoration, and at the unity of the Christian moral life. Our whole life is meant to be Eucharistic. A commentary on the words of consecration is we, having received Jesus' body and blood, go out to say to others, this is my body, this is my blood, this is my sweat, my heart, my calloused hands, all my efforts given and poured out for you. This Sunday, Jesus puts before us that way of holiness, that way of that path of wisdom, that root of life and love. Let's ask the Eucharistic Lord to help us choose him who is the way with all our heart and commit ourselves to help others to take that same wise Eucharistic path. God bless you. Thank you, Father Landry. To hear more from Father Landry, check out his website at catholicpreaching.com and you can also catch his writings at EWTN's own National Catholic Register. A big thank you to all our listeners for joining us. I hope that this show was helpful. I hope that it gave you more peace and more hope and more joy and you go with our prayers. 